Smoke rises from the altar while priests chant solemn verses from memory. All around you, the crowd is bending down with their foreheads on the ground, chanting with the priests. Bleeding of a sheep comes from the front. You look up just in time to see a priest cut its throat and allow the blood to run over the altar and drain into the drain floor at its base. The sheep is quickly and efficiently butchered, fat from the entrails cut away and added to the fire on the altar, while the meat's taken away to feed the priests and their families. The smoke, the, the crush of bodies, the smells and sounds, you feel your heart moved. You're worshiping. It's 600 BC, and you're in the temple in Jerusalem. Priests in dark hooded robes chant psalms in unison. They are gathered around the altar at the front of the tall stone building. Their backs are turned to the congregation. You're kneeling with others in the group on the cold stone floor over somebody's grave. You see someone in the front of the priests gather priests lift high a gold plate and a golden chalice, the body and blood of the Lord. Your heart leaps in your chest. The priest turns and gives bread to each of those that is gathered in that half circle at the front, the other priests and the, and the friars. Partakes of it himself, the bread. When the chanting stops, the priest comes down the center of the building with a smoking incense burner, wafting it over the whole congregation. Behind him, another priest comes and with a device of sprinkling water on the congregation. The smell of frankincense and the sprinkle of water moves you again. You're worshiping. It's 600 AD. You sit silently in a circle. At the center is a small table with a candle and an open Bible. A woman stands up and announces a song and you sing it together. And then you sit silently again. A man stands up and quotes a scripture and then adds what it, it means to him today and what he thinks it means for all of you today. He sits. You sit silently, sensing that God is near, in the midst of the circle. You're worshiping at a Quaker monthly meeting in 1850. You quietly play your guitar and sing familiar choruses to yourself. You're in your room praising and praying, spending time alone with God. Many of the songs are scriptures, paraphrased and set to music. After a while, you take out your Bible and you read a portion. You think about it for a while and you make notes, both in a notebook and in the margins of your Bible. You might speak in tongues or in a language you know, bringing your adoration your confession, your thanksgiving, and your prayers of intercession to God. You're worshiping, and it's 1976. The beating of a drum is the first thing you notice. And then the colorful flowing robes that everyone is wearing. You dance with joy down the street to your pastor's house. And he and his wife join you, and, and you dance them to church. And then you split into groups, with each group going to one of the deacons or deaconesses' houses, and they join you when you get there, and you dance and sing down the street back into the church, and you sit, well, at least some of the time, spend a lot of time jumping up and dancing some more. Children run to and fro through the sanctuary. Um, sometimes you're dancing your altar to the front. Why would you bring a 20-franc note to church if you could bring four fives and dance to the front four times with your offering? The pastors and deacons take turns preaching, accented by shouts from the congregation. Someone's reminded of a hymn while one of the deaconesses is preaching, and, 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 they, and you sing it together. Hours pass. You smell, you smell the roasting calf from outside. Your meal together. Calf means it must be a celebration. Easter or Pentecost or what's the other one that's big in North America? Oh, yeah, Christmas. Otherwise, it'd be lentils and rice, but you always eat together. The warm, sweaty smells around you make you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. You're worshiping. It's 1995 in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. As people enter the sanctuary, they kneel facing the tabernacle, usually off to the side where the communion elements are stored. 
They cross themselves and they make their ways to their seats. They, they fold down the kneelers and they kneel, resting their hands on the pew in front of them and their foreheads and they pray. The service proceeds in its expected form with the priest leading the congregation and the congregation responding and also with your spirit. Three scriptures are read and the congregation responds with thanks be to God after each one of them. A short sermon is preached and then communion is celebrated. You join the confession and you join in the thanksgiving and you line up to come forward to receive the bread, a wafer, the body of the Lord, the priest says. You take it and you, and you dip it into the chalice of wine and you eat it as you walk back to your seat. The body and blood of the Lord as you chew and swallow, your heart rejoices in the gifts of God. It's 2006, and you're worshiping. The worship leader welcomes everybody sitting in the half circle around the raised platform, and also the people who are on Zoom. They invite announcements. The congregational chair comes to the front to remind everybody that the annual meeting is this week, and you're supposed to come out to that. Someone on Zoom reminds folk of the worship committee meeting that week, which is also going to take place on Zoom. A group comes to the front and, and leads a number of songs using guitar and piano and, and violin for accompaniment. Some in the group raise their hands as they sing. Some read the words off the TV monitor. Some use hymn books. The worship leader invites folk to share items for the praise of praise or requests for intercession. And using those, plus the ones that are printed in the bulletin and the ones that come from the people on Zoom, leads the congregation in a prayer. She reminds you all that you need to keep on giving to the congregation, both for the congregation's needs and for missions. Scripture is read. The pastor comes to the front to talk about that scripture. Everyone sits quietly. Another song is sung, and the worship leader gives a blessing, and then the room bursts into noise as conversations spring up all over the place. You feel part of the family with God as the Father of us all. Jesus, our brother, and the Spirit connecting us all. You're worshiping. It's April the 3rd, 2022, and you're at CMF. So many ways, and all the same thing. And I'm betting you could tell more stories of worship services, I, and I know you could. And at the end of the sermon, in fact, I'm gonna leave a bit of room for somebody, one or two or three, come up quickly and tell a short story of worship of any kind. Worship is a mystery. Somehow our words and actions, our feelings and thoughts are a spiritual practice. And I wondered about how to define worship in a sermon, and I thought the best way would be to simply tell stories of worship. Worthship is an old English word from which our word worship comes. Worship is telling someone that they are worthy. And that's why, to this day, it's still the proper way to address a judge. Your worship. In the court, either as defendant or as the lawyer or a member of the jury or a witness, you are under that person sitting at the front the one who guides the process and can make decisions that will affect people's lives for the rest of their lives. They are the worthiest person in the room, so you call them your worship. We worship God, the creator of all that there is, including ourselves. We worship God, who through Jesus is reconciling all things to God and is reconciling each part of the creation to each other part of the creation. We worship God, the one who in spirit is in all and through all, in everything, in every being, and the one in which the whole creation is. We praise and we adore, we acknowledge God's worthiness. We bow in confession, we raise our hands in joy, we bring our requests and our offerings, acknowledging God's rulership over ourselves. We wait for God's blessing and we listen to God's word read and expounded. Worship is a mystery. Somehow our minds and emotions, wills, bodies, our community, our very essence of life, our spirit, all joins together to somehow or other declare that God is worthy. Worship is a spiritual practice, drawing us closer to God, 
and creating room for God to be at work in us. In worship, we come to be with our friend and celebrate how much this friend means to us, how much they have done for us, how beautiful, creative, sustaining, encouraging, leading, growing, comforting, and on and on our friend is. We draw near to God in worship. And as we do, we bend our wills, we, we open up a space inside us for God to change us as God desires to change us. From anxious to peaceful, from irritable to calm, from jealous, greedy, and unforgiving to gracious, giving, and forgiving, and on and on and on. Because we, as we draw near, we draw near to our friend who loves us exactly as we are, as we, and we love them, and they love us in return. We worship in a group. We worship alone. I stuck that one story of worshiping alone in there to, try to create a bit of balance. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and pastor who resisted Hitler during the Second World War, wrote, if one cannot worship in the group, they cannot worship alone. If they cannot worship alone, then they cannot worship in the group either. We worship alone and with others. His point was that being a Christian means being part of a group of Christians, as hard as that always is. Being in community is part of worship as we meet God with our sisters and brothers and as God uses those same sisters and brothers to shape us. So how does this work out practically? Well, we come to worship. You know, you could have done something else with this hour this morning. You, in many ways, by simply showing up here or on Zoom, are saying, God, you're worth more than anything else to me in this hour. I've already said that worship is a mystery. I don't know how it works but it's the melding of our thoughts and feelings, decisions, bodies, relationships, and our, and our very life essence into acknowledging God as the be-all and end-all. We choose to do it with our minds. We feel to do it with our emotions. We experience it in our body. Sometimes we plan for it. Other times it just happens spontaneously. Sometimes we have to work at it. Sometimes it explodes into our lives and through our whole beings. Every time we see beauty and we say, praise God, we're worshiping. Every time we express gratitude to God or to someone else, we're worshiping. Every time we have a scripted prayer or pray spontaneously, whether it's the thousandth time or the first time we're worshiping God. When we sing a golden oldie, which changes generation by generation, by the way. Unity was a brand new song when I was a teenager, and now it's a golden oldie. We're worshiping. When we sing 606, which it isn't that number anymore, we all know, with 10,000 people, or as we sing just as I am by myself, we're worshiping. Worship can be the same from person to person, or it can be different from person to person, as well as from group to group and from time to time. Worship is a mystery, and it's something that we do all the time. Anybody have a story? short story of worship. <laughs>